to oral questions put by members to ministers. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. As I'm sure many of us now are aware, the government members of the Public Accounts Committee this morning have taken an unprecedented step to limit the public or accountability of this government. Order, please. I'd like to remind the honourable member that uh, question period is not the place for matters that are before, uh, under the jurisdiction of a committee or under consideration of the speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last week, I asked the Premier about Ronald Newfield and the Nova Scotia Supreme Court decision that ordered the province to turn over documents that had been denied by IAP officers. That decision was handed down by the Supreme Court on June 18th, more than three months ago. The window for the province to appeal the decision closed more than two weeks ago. But the, Mr. Newfield has not received the documents, nor has he received any word on when he might receive the documents. Can the Premier confirm that the documents have been sent to Mr. Newfield, or can he at least say when they will be sent? The Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank you for the question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I don't know the specifics of that. I don't know the answer to that one, but I'll ask to find out uh, where it is. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. This week is the Right to Know Week. It is an opportunity to raise awareness of an individual's right to access government information while promoting freedom of information as essential to both democracy and good governance. The FOIPOP Commissioner reviewed the documents in the Newfield case and determined that Mr. Newfield had a right to the documents. The Supreme Court of Nova Scotia agrees with the FOIPOP Commissioner. Whomever makes these decisions for government, they must seem to not understand the rules because they're definitely on the wrong side of this one. If it's not the FOIA POP Commissioner, can the Premier tell the House who has the final say on what information gets released under a FOIA POP request? The Honourable Premier. Speaker, uh, the Honourable Member would know uh, FOIA POP would enter into the Department. Uh, they would follow through uh, with that. It would not get to the political level. Mr. Speaker, it would be in the Deputy Ministers, who I think is the final sign off in individual departments. Uh, that would, that, that's a process. Uh, to your first question, I think if you redirect that first question to the Minister of Fisheries, he would be able to respond to that. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on her final supplementary. I will continue my question with the Premier. The FOIA POP Commissioner disagreed with the government on the Newfield case. The FOIA POP Commissioner disagreed with the government on the death of an inmate in 2014, Phase 3 of the Riverview Adult Residential Facility in Pictou County. Register, register pension plans and the private email account of the former Minister of Health. These are just the cases that we are aware of, Mr. Speaker. The FOIA POP Commissioner believes the government was wrong in all four cases. However, the Premier believes the Commissioner is wrong. I believe we should just settle this right now. Will the Premier commit to another independent review to determine whether IAP staff are complying with FOIA POP legislation. The Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we don't have a FOIA POP Commissioner. We have a FOIA POP Officer, Mr. Speaker. Just a clarification. Uh, the reality is, Mr. Speaker, the reality is, Mr. Speaker, we're continuing to go through the process, Mr. Speaker. We now have over 80 percent of the FOIA POPs going out, the highest number, Mr. Speaker, in the history of our province, higher than any other government has been able to achieve within 30 days, Mr. Speaker. We're continuing to improve the process, continuing to make sure, and, and when the Information Officer Mr. Speaker makes recommendations to continue to make sure to how we implement them. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Mr. Speaker, respectfully and without contention, I would like to ask the Premier about the difficult subject of suicide prevention. It's a, a subject that we stand before in Nova Scotia today in the shadow of the recent tragedies in Eskazoni. And I would like to ask the Premier uh, what, in his judgment, can we do in Nova Scotia to improve suicide prevention programming in our province? The Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank uh, the Honourable Member for the question. As we continue to go uh, working with those experts on evidence-based solutions to how do we continue to ensure that those Nova Scotians who feel there is no way out, no path forward, uh, that we ensure that we surround them with the appropriate supports. 
Uh, it's uh, very early on. We know if we have early identification, early detection, uh, that we can address some of the issues. That that's what we do in the wraparound part that we're trying to do with schools. Uh, we continue to, to, to rely on the work and support of uh, Stan Kutcher when it comes to ensuring that we have evidence-based solutions in our communities. And I think it's important, Mr. Speaker, as we have uh, the, uh, our, our experts, our healthcare experts, out in communities that they actually continue to get in communities to understand the cultural sensitivity of some of our communities and the important part of how we provide them uh, with a path forward in a culturally uh, sensitive uh, environment uh, that helps uh, get the best outcomes. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Do I thank the Premier for his answer. Uh, the Suicide uh, uh, Prevention Centre speaks of there being four primary best practices in, in this area, means restriction and responsible media reporting and education, but there, there is a fourth that they speak of as uh, being more important than the others, and that's easy, uh, quick access to mental health care. For example, at our Bears Road Clinic, a person calling today uh, receives, uh, is given an appointment in the spring and now uh, into the summer. So I, I want to ask the Premier, how can we continue to accept waits of so many months for people in the province who are reaching out to the mental health services of our province? The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Honourable Member knows each and every time we continue to make sure that we improve uh, the wait times for all of our health care service, particularly when the Honourable Member is referring uh, to a situation when uh, uh, someone is in crisis. How do we provide them that support to, to ensure that we begin them on the path back to healing? Uh, it is a multifaceted approach on how we try to deal with this stuff. It's, uh, our, the, the, the goal is, is working towards ensuring uh, early detection early on, but we know we now have uh, uh, Nova Scotians who require our support uh, and require the system to be more responsive than it is at this moment in time, uh, that we continue to improve and try to make sure that we bring that wait time down uh, so that we respond to that citizen when they need it. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Thank you. Just very recently, Dr. Simon Sherry, psychologist, called on the province to bring forward a coordinated strategy to deal with our rising suicide rate in the province. And as he spoke about this, he was adamant about how it would be important for such a strategy to have a firm uh, timelines and dedicated uh, funding in order to be able to achieve its purposes. And we do note that in Quebec, a program parallel to this sort has been brought forward and it has been achieving uh, measurable and dramatic improvements. And so I, I want to ask the Premier, when in our province uh, can we hope to see a, a funded and comprehensive suicide prevention program in place? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. And Dr. Sherry, who he was referring to, raised uh, concerns and issues. Uh, I wanted to, uh, through, to, to the Honourable Member, through you, to tell him uh, that the work is underway uh, to do exactly just that. Uh, and, and the Minister of Health will report to Nova Scotia when that is completed. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Justice. For many Nova Scotians, the only way they can purchase legal cannabis is online. The very act of making a purchase online means Nova Scotians will have to give personal information such as addresses, a credit card number, phone number. The events of last April with the Foy Pop portal create a concern that this government may not be fully equipped to keep the information of online cannabis buyers safe and secure. Will the minister guarantee today that the names, addresses, credit card, phone numbers, and other personal information of Nova Scotians who buy cannabis online will be safeguarded? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, working with the Nova Scotia Liquor Corporation, we're very conscious of the circumstances that my colleague has, uh, has alluded to today, and we'll continue to build a platform and portal uh, that addresses the protection of privacy of uh, individuals' personal information. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. 
Thank you very much, and I thank the minister for his answer. As I said, though, last week, an official from the U.S. Customs and Border Protection Agency indicated that any Canadian involved with the cannabis industry risks a lifetime travel ban from the United States. And there have been many media reports indicating that Canadians who admit to smoking legal cannabis risk being banned from the United States for life and might have to apply for special waivers to get into the country, and I will table that actual story. It is disturbing, Mr. Speaker, that Nova Scotia will have a database of Nova Scotians who have purchased and presumably used cannabis with all their personal <coughs> information. Will the minister explain exactly how the database will be used and guarantee that it will not be placed in the hands of the U.S. government? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as I indicated in response to the first question, we're working closely with the Nova Scotia Liquor Corporation, very conscious of the circumstances that my colleague has identified. Uh, it is a priority to, uh, to protect the personal information uh, of those individuals who choose to purchase online. But at this point, uh, Mr. Speaker, there has been no final decision made, and we will absolutely respect uh, both the desires of my colleague and the personal information of Nova Scotians. The Honourable Member for Truro, Bible Hill, Millbrook, Salmon River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Labour and Advanced Education. The outgoing President of Dalhousie received almost $500,000 last year, half a million dollars. And because of this government's inaction, we can expect the new President will be handed just as much or even more. That money is coming out of public funding, Mr. Speaker, as well as tuition fees that students go deep into debt to pay. So my question for the minister, why is he continuing to allow public funding and tuition fees to be spent on lavish compensation packages for university presidents? The Honourable Minister of Labour and Advanced Education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, as the member would know, all universities in this province are governed by a board, and that board is not the government and it's not MLAs in this house. Mr. Speaker, I will uh, wish Dr. Florizone all the success in his future. He has been an integral part of the success of this province. A couple highlights, Mr. Speaker. He was instrumental in bringing over $200 million worth of research money for ocean technology to the province. Mr. Speaker, new engineering building is being built for Dalhousie, and Mr. Speaker, the course that Dalhousie is on is just remarkable. They have really stepped up their game, and they are—they've hit it out of the park. It's—it's—it's it's, it's a fantastic institution. Very proud of them, as I am with all our institutions in Nova Scotia. Thank the you. Member for Truro Bible Hill Millbrook Salmon River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Three years ago, the then Minister of Labour and Advanced Education agreed aspects of university president compensation have gone too far. She said something else that I was happy to agree with. She said, quote, at a time when universities are asking government and students for more money, it's just not acceptable for this kind of thing to go on. I will table that, Mr. Speaker. She vowed to stop it, but nothing has changed. Mr. Speaker, there is no excuse for not making this change. Alberta has done it. Alberta has put a cap on base salaries and limited perks, which will result in up to $5.2 million in annual savings. So my question for the minister is this. Will he commit to putting a limit on compensation for university executives? The Honourable Minister of Labour and Advanced Education. Mr. Speaker, we can sit there and limit compensation, but then we're not attracting the brightest and we're not attracting the best. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, if you want to attract the brightest and the best to deliver a great job and to actually deliver results, you have to pay for them. And Mr. Speaker, you know, the member can go on about Alberta, what they're doing, but all we have to do is look at their government, which added $3 billion of debt to the province of Nova Scotia. The Honourable Member for Sackville Beaver Bank. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And my question today uh, is to the Minister of Municipal Affairs. Yesterday, the FOIPOP officer released a report uh, on the FOIPOP practices of the Municipality of Kings.
The officer found that the municipality is in violation of the Municipal Government Act. The municipality failed to respond to information requests in the statutory 30 days. There were no authorized extensions that were given. The municipality failed to respond in writing to the applicant within 30 days and the municipality agreed the, to the resolution times on a number of files with the officer but failed to honour their agreements. The officer said that the case showed that the municipal government is an adequate tool to ensuring meaningful right to access of information. My question is, will the Minister of Municipal Affairs undertake to fix the MGA to ensure that the municipal staff take advantage of training offered by the privacy officer? The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, the Department of Municipal Affairs would expect uh, the County of Kings or any county to uh, follow the rules that are outlined uh, within the MGA. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Sackville Beaverbank. Uh, yes, thank you um, again, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Ms. Minister. Over the last number of weeks, it's become abundantly clear that this government is willing to thumb their noses at the recommendation of the FOIPOP officer in order to keep information secret. It's fair to say that the government has set a poor example for municipalities across this province. The privacy officer is recommended that the municipality of Can Kings respond to the five outstanding requests within 10 days. My question to the Minister is what advice is the Minister going to give to the municipality? Do as I say, not as I do, or just to ignore the recommendations of the Privacy Officer? The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, This Minister would encourage the, uh, encourage the County of Kings and every other county, uh, town, village, whatever they may be, Mr. Speaker, to uh, follow the rules that are outlined in the MGA and uh, review their best practices as to how they're doing that. As far as the uh, officer goes, Mr. Speaker, the Premier's been very clear in our position around that. He's addressed this and I support that 100%. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Pictou Centre. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Health and Wellness. Mr. Speaker, Nova Scotians were dismayed last spring when they learned of the death of Chrissy Dunnington. As members know, Chrissy, who lived in a long-term care facility, died of a pressure sore. Unfortunately, we now know that Chrissy was not the only Nova Scotian to die in this way. We learned yesterday that 93-year-old John Ferguson also died as a result of a pressure sore. His daughter, Norma Silverstein, said her father died of neglect. My question to the Minister, will the Minister require long-term care facilities to make the number of patients with pressure sores and the severity of those pressure sores publicly available? Families have the right to know. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I do appreciate uh, the member uh, raising this uh, question. Uh, the fact is, Mr. Speaker, uh, we uh, all, as, as the member noted in his preamble, uh, all Nova Scotians uh, were concerned about the circumstances that uh, were coming forward. Uh, my role with the department, uh, we took action to, to collect information that uh, we hadn't previously been, been collecting in this regard. Uh, we made the, our first preliminary data set available back in, uh, I believe, late uh, June or July. July. Uh, work is ongoing, Mr. Speaker, to address uh, and improve the situation in our, our long-term care facilities. Uh, we've committed to uh, making uh, data available, uh, but Mr. Speaker, this time uh, we're making sure that it's uh, consistently collected uh, and reported uh, so that we have consistent data when we do post it publicly. Once we get that established, uh, it will be available for all Nova Scotians to see. The Honourable Member for Pictou Centre. <clears throat> Uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Speaker, they found 152 cases of stage 3 and 4 pressure sores across the province. That's 152 families who are worried their loved ones will meet the same fate as Chrissy or Mr. Ferguson. That's 152 families who cannot wait for a committee to make recommendations. Question to the Minister. Will the Minister advise the House if any of the 152 long-term care residents have died as a result of pressure sores and what actions have been taken? to decrease the incidence of pressure sores in long-term care facilities. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. We've taken a, a number of uh, steps uh, since uh, the spring-summer. Uh, 
the first step was, of course, uh, collecting the data to categorize the uh, the scope of the uh, current uh, situation. Uh, once we had identified that, uh, the member cited uh, some of that data, which we had made public. Uh, we uh, brought together some some uh, people with a, more experience in this area. Uh, we developed an educational plan and checklist uh, that we had vetted by some uh, experts, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, then we rolled that out uh, to uh, facilities. We had. Uh, people go out and support those facilities that were reporting uh, stage three and four uh, pressure injuries. Uh, that work, Mr. Speaker, continued throughout the months of July and August. I'm um, just waiting to get the feedback from those uh, those that were out uh, in the field uh, conducting this. But my own anecdotal uh, sense, Mr. Speaker, as I was meeting with uh, facilities uh, throughout the province, feedback was very positive of the experience. The Honourable Member for Northside, Westmount. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, here we go again. Recently, a 97-year-old woman arrived at the Northside General, experienced eye pain at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. After waiting for an astounding four hours at the hospital, she was had to be transferred to Cape Breton Regional Hospital because there was no ophthalmologist on site. Once she arrived at the Cape Breton Regional Hospital about 7 p.m., she was told again that there was no ophthalmologist on site and that she would be transferred to St. Martha's in Anaganish. Arriving at St. Martha's at 2 in the morning, she was told there was no ophthalmologist there either and was put back in the ambulance where she headed to Halifax and had eye surgery at 7 a.m. in the morning. My question to the Minister is this. Would a reasonable government consider this an appropriate level of care for Nova Scotia's most vulnerable? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as the member would know, uh, not able to uh, discuss uh, specific uh, cases of, of individuals uh, in care, and as the member uh, may also uh, realize that uh, it, that level of uh, detail is not something that I'm necessarily uh, aware of on a day-to-day -day basis. But, Mr. Speaker, uh, we do continue uh, to, to work uh, in the province to uh, improve access to uh, care, both at the primary care level but also specialists. Mr. Speaker, in the last couple of weeks, uh, We've announced uh, the addition of five additional uh, specialist services uh, throughout the, the, the province, as well as uh, the expansion of our uh, specialist residency program, Mr. Speaker. Fifteen additional residents will be training and uh, likely staying in the province to work when they're completed. The Honourable Member for Northside, Westbound. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I don't think my microphone is working because the Minister of Health can't hear the questions I'm asking. I'm asking for his opinion. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, if it only ended there. After having her surgery at the VG, this 97-year-old was put back in an ambulance, taken back to the Northside Guest Home, where she arrived at 1.30 in the morning. Think about this, Mr. Speaker. It took four hospitals, close to 48 hours, for this 97-year-old woman to receive the care she deserved. No wonder ambulance times are, are taking so long, and the Nova Scotia roads and the condition are in with all the driving they're doing on it, Mr. Speaker. So I'm going to ask the Minister, will the Minister please explain which part of this fiasco meets his standards of acceptable health care in the province of Nova Scotia? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as, as I've uh, mentioned to the, the member uh, opposite, uh, we recognize uh, the need to, to improve uh, access to care in this province. That's why we're taking the steps, as I've uh, previously outlined, to expand uh, both uh, primary care access uh, to physicians and nurse practitioners. I've uh, mentioned uh, numerous times uh, here, Mr. Speaker, uh, steps that we're taking. In addition, in this case, uh, the members are referring to specialized services. Uh, I've noted that we do recognize this, Mr. Speaker, through the input of uh, clinicians on the front line. They identified priority areas for us, Mr. Speaker, to expand and add additional specialists. Those nine specialist positions have been added uh, throughout the system, as well as the 15 residency seats, Mr. Speaker. We recognize the need to do more, and we're taking steps to do just that. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Community Services. Access to transportation is important, and I am pleased that bus passes are now available for ESIA clients who live near a bus route. Who live near a bus route? However, the implementation of this pr uh, program has provided more evidence of how inadequate income assistance rates are in this province. Some ESIA recipients had been using their transportation money to cover shortfalls in what they had to spend on rent and food. Now they have bus passes, but will see a reduction in their monthly checks which are now even further from covering their costs. Without understanding the lives of people receiving IA, the unintended consequence is that the Minister has made their situation worse. Mr. Speaker, will the Minister acknowledge that this policy change has worsened the situation for many people who are already feeling desperate? The Honourable Minister of Community Services. I want to thank the Honourable Member uh, for the question. Uh, I do 
I do know, Mr. Speaker, that when we went out and consulted with people who were living in poverty, what they told us was that not being able to get around was very difficult for them. They couldn't get groceries, they couldn't go to work, they couldn't get to, get to school, they, et cetera. So some people were getting additional money to do that, Mr. Speaker. They applied, they had to have a certain number of doctor's appointments or things like that so that they would be able to get uh, their bus pass money. Now we are giving them a bus pass which is uh, in excess of what uh, they would have received in terms of bus pass money. They can get out actually to the airport uh, with this particular bus pass. It's not only just for those people, Mr. Speaker, it is also for their spouse and for their children. And what we heard, Mr. Speaker, when we were at the sessions where we were in fact uh, giving those out was that it was changing lives. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Dermot North. Mr. Speaker, based on the National Nutritious Food Basket, a family of four would need to spend about $850 a month to buy healthy food. <clears throat> Excuse me. That grocery bill would be more than the entire personal allowance that family would receive from the department. Sorry, one second. <coughs> We know that the current rates do not provide people with enough money to pay the rent or buy nutritious food. The anticipated 2 to 5% increase after transformation will not cut it. Mr. Speaker, will the minister commit today to an increase in income assistance rates that will ensure all families can buy nutritious food? The Honourable Minister of Community Services. I want to thank the Honourable Member for her question and I want to assure her that we have taken a number of steps to improve the situation of people who are living in poverty. So in, in recent months, we have, for example, doubled the poverty reduction tax credit, which focuses on those people who often don't have other sources of income, for example, child, uh, child benefits, etc. So we focused on, we doubled that so that those people would see an increase in their money, Mr. Speaker. We also uh, began uh, removing, and this just happened in August, we no longer count maintenance money uh, towards chargeable income, Mr. Speaker. Next month, next week, we have a new wage exemption coming in, Mr. Speaker. So now, when people who are living on income assistance earn money, they get to keep more of it and help better their situations. For Sydney River, Myra Lewisburg. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, my question through you is to the Minister of Health and Wellness. Recently, a constituent of mine, Trina McNiven, told me a very heartbreaking story. Trina's brother is very ill and needs a kidney transplant. Trina and her family have watched as her brother's quality of life has declined. What is breaking her heart? is that Trina is a perfect match with her brother. All that stands between her brother and a better quality of life is some OR time, Mr. Speaker. My question for the minister is, and I know we can't talk about specific cases, but will the minister tell the House how long the wait list is for live donor kidney transplants? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I don't have that uh, information uh, on hand here, but I'm certainly uh, happy to, uh, to connect uh, with the member. Uh, we do uh, have uh, many of our wait times posted online, though, uh, Mr. Speaker, where uh, Nova Scotians are able to uh, monitor. I'd have to double check to see if that specific uh, wait uh, parameter is uh, part of that uh, or not. But again, I'll reach out if it's not there uh, to uh, let the member know. The Honourable Member for Sydney River, Myra Lewisburg. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I'll look forward to getting that information from the Minister. But I do know from conversations with the family that they've been waiting since March. The process has been put off until June, and here we are today, still nothing. Trina says that the Rainier failure is killing her brother. She says she's not ready to say goodbye to him. Especially, Mr. Speaker, since she has the thing that can save his life and is eager to give it to him. Now, Mr. Speaker, if that doesn't describe a health care crisis, it's certainly a crisis in Trina's family. So will the minister explain why is it taking so long for live donor kidney transplants? The Honourable Minister of Health. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I can't uh, speak uh, uh, as the member uh, noted earlier about uh, individual cases, uh, but certainly, uh, if the member has uh, wanted to uh, to provide uh, any additional details that he that he has, we'd certainly look uh, into that specific uh, situation. Uh, as far as uh, the duration or, or how long uh, the wait lists may be, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm not aware of the clinical uh, parameters for preparing once a, a match is identified. What the standards may be expected. Uh, for that type of uh, treatment, Mr. Speaker. Um, but uh, certainly I'd uh, expect that the uh, renal program and those uh, professionals uh, and clinicians working that space would be well uh, versed in that. Uh, and, uh, and, and they do endeavor, Mr. Speaker, to provide the best care possible to all of the uh, patients in the program. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton, Richmond. Mr. Speaker, on three separate occasions in the spring sitting and now what will be twice in this sitting, I raise the unacceptable lack of resources and services available for patients and families facing the death of a loved one in Cape Breton, Richmond. People are passing their last days and weeks in hallways in this province, Mr. Speaker. They are dying in emergency rooms, which are ill-equipped to accommodate their needs, and they are even passing their last days and weeks in storage closets, Mr. Speaker. It is absolutely deplorable. Horrible. On April the 17th, the Premier, in response to my question, stated, it is completely unacceptable that a Nova Scotian looking for end-of-life care is put in the conditions that the Honourable Member raised in this House. I would like to ask the Premier if he finds it equally unacceptable that in the five months that have passed, the only response received from the Minister of Health is a letter dated August 29th, advising the Straight Richmond Palliative Care Society that the con to contact the NSHA with their concerns. The Honourable Premier. You, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. Uh, I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question, Mr. Speaker. There are two uh, palliative care beds, Mr. Speaker, in Straight Richmond, uh, Mr. Speaker, that occasionally are filled up uh, with acute care patients. Uh, uh, I believe that seriously is an issue that we need to try to deal with to address. As you know, there are three. Uh, GPs that have committed to, to doing palliative care at home. We have a nurse practitioner as part of that, uh, uh, as part of that, uh, doing as well palliative care at home. I know this facility well, Mr. Speaker. My family is from this particular riding. Uh, I've lost my, many of my own family in that facility doing palliative care. Uh, this is an ongoing, uh, an ongoing um, service that we're continuing to make sure that we make available in communities across the province, and uh, Straight Richmond is one of those. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Richmond. Mr. Speaker, Cape Breton Richmond and the Straight Richmond Palliative Care Society and the families that are here today need a plan. They need an investment. They need an answer. Again, on April 17th, the Premier stated, the Honourable Member would know there have been no dedicated palliative care beds in the Straight Richmond Hospital. We know that. That's the problem. I tabled a plan on their behalf to change that, Mr. Speaker. The Premier continued to say, I will ensure that the document arrives in the right hands. I also said to the honourable member outside of this house that I would make sure she had the appropriate meetings at the appropriate time. Can the Premier please inform me what he plans to deliver and when to deliver on that promise, Mr. Speaker, because I would the, hope he is a man of his word. The honourable Premier order, please. I'd just like to remind the Honourable Member for Cape Breton, Richmond, Richmond that it's uh, unparliamentary against the rules of this House to call into question the integrity of another member of this House. So, the Honourable Premier. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I, I want to uh, tell the Honourable Member that the information she provided to me was delivered to, to the Department. I also want to tell her, as we look at palliative care services across the province, uh, each community will be different. I, I also want to tell her there are uh, two palliative care beds in Straight Richmond, Mr. Speaker, that at times become part of the acute care system. Uh, we need to deal with how, we, how do we address that. Uh, at the same time, uh, we are also hearing from many Nova Scotians who want to receive palliative care services at home. Uh, we're working to ensure that we have those health care teams to be able to provide that service, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, all families. As we go through an end-of-life process with one of the people we care about and love about, there's many challenges associated with, and the system should be flexible and responsive enough to ensure that we have the appropriate kinds of services that meet the needs of uh, that end of life for that particular family and we'll continue to work uh, with the, the people of Straight Richmond uh, to ensure that we can continue to enhance uh, the work that is going on there uh, by the good healthcare professionals to deal with families at end of life. The Honourable Member for Pictou East. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. I've spoken with and met many businesses in uh, Pictou County and beyond about the implications of the new uh, federal tax changes the, that the government is set to enact. Many of these small business owners, including doctors, are going to pay more, even with the amendments that the feds have now uh, proposed to, to make. So they'll be paying more, and it's hard enough, as we know, Mr. Speaker, to attract and retain doctors here in this province. We know entrepreneurs can have a hard time succeeding in this province, but they're all going to pay more. And the province stands to, stands to get a slice of these two new tax measures. I'd like to ask the minister if the minister can say how much additional revenue the province stands to gain from the pending tax changes. The Honourable Minister of Finance. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, to the member, uh, thank you for the question. I, uh, I certainly want to uh, acknowledge and share with all members of the House that um, early on in our mandate, uh, there were questions asked about tax reform, and we made a commitment that as we could afford it, we would be implementing tax reform that would be our, our taxes for our Nova Scotians. And we have done that through changing the basic personal exemption. We've also done that with a tax break for small businesses, and we will continue to look at that. With respect to the uh, revenue that may come from the corporate tax of the federal government. Uh, I cannot give the member an estimate of what that will be, but that would show up in our, uh, in our budget when we have that revenue in our books. The Honourable Member for Picto East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It would be a little windfall for the province. That's the type of windfall in the olden days we might have been able to look at at public accounts, but maybe no more, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Speaker. The government has a chance to send a signal to small businesses. The government has a chance to send a signal to doctors. The province has to make legislative changes to incorporate these federal changes. They can stand up to them. Manitoba is standing up to them. Saskatchewan is looking at changing up to them, standing up to them, and then Nova Scotia should as well. I'd like to ask the minister, as the minister asked her department, to look at the prospect of opting out of these changes, and if not, will the minister consider it? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and to the member and to all members of the House. Uh, whenever we can look at any tax uh, changes that will be a benefit to Nova Scotians, we recognize that the more money that Nova Scotians have in their pocket, the more uh, consumer spending that there will be that drives the economy of our province. We want to make sure that we ensure that the members, uh, the Nova Scotians, have as much of the disposable income as they can possibly have. If that means looking at federal uh, tax, uh, corporate tax, we will do that. The Honourable Member for Truro Bible Hill Millbrook Salmon River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister responsible for the status of women. On Monday, the editorial board of a national newspaper singled out Nova Scotia's failure to provide timely access to abortion services. It turned out that the health authority prevents many women from receiving the procedure before their eighth week of pregnancy when it is safest for them to do so. Although the province approved funding for medical abortions last year, the woman in the story found it easier to fly to Toronto for the procedure than get it here. Unacceptable. Mr. Speaker. So my question for the minister is this. What is the minister doing to make timely access to reproductive health care in Nova Scotia a reality? The Honourable Minister responsible for the status of women. I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question and I do want to thank uh, the woman who wrote the article and uh, anyone who has come forward to talk about the particular situation involved with providing abortions here in Nova Scotia. As the Honourable Members know, uh, we made a number of changes earlier this year that have in fact increased access to abortions. but. Uh, um, in this particular case, it appears that, that the woman did not get the timely service which uh, she deserved. And um, I want to assure the Honourable Member that I will work with my colleague in the Department of Health uh, to ensure that we are able to do better. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Truro Bible Hill, Millbrook, Salmon River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate that answer from the Minister. And speaking of the Minister of Health, uh, my second question is for him. Other provinces, in other provinces, women have timely access to the health care that they to which they are entitled in Nova Scotia the health authority policies prevent the staff of our abortion clinic from even using the ultrasound machine that they had to fundraise to to uh, achieve as one doctor put it it's frustrating for us to see these systemic barriers as the reason why someone cannot access abortion so my question is this 
Mr. Speaker, the Department of Health has the power to change these policies. So will the minister explain why his government will not remove these barriers to abortion services in Nova Scotia? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, as I've been uh, looking into uh, the details uh, surrounding this and the status and, uh, and, the, and the policies, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, one of the uh, things that uh, I've been advised is, in fact, uh, the clinical uh, parameters and uh, requirements as to how uh, these services are provided uh, are really uh, guidelines being established across uh, national uh, organizations within the, uh, the, the clinics, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this isn't uh, something where I, I the department has established uh, any kind of policy to prevent uh, the clinical uh, services being provided. Uh, we do know, Mr. Speaker, that the changes that we've uh, implemented last year has resulted in increased access. Uh, we've uh, allowed for uh, direct referrals, something that hadn't been allowed for, for decades since uh, the service was allowed for. Medical abortions now, Mr. Speaker, available in rural parts of the province, throughout the province, which required some fee code changes, so it took a little bit more time, Mr. Speaker, than we would have liked. Uh, but indeed, Mr. Speaker, we've been making changes, increasing access. The Honourable Member for Queen's Shelburne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Acting Minister of Environment. This past summer, many days saw large numbers of people visit Carter's Beach because of its natural beauty. When a large number of people, large number of people arrive at the same time without proper parking, washroom and refuse facilities, it creates a problem for everyone. Last October, I questioned the Minister over his department's infrastructure plans regarding Carter's Beach for the upcoming season. The department removed the garbage cans and instead erected a sign advising beach visitors to pack in and pack out. Sadly, given the picture I've received, this hasn't worked and I will table that. My question to the Minister is, can the Minister please tell me if the department believes that this year's pack in, pack out was a success at Carter's Beach? The Honourable Acting Minister of the Environment. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, appreciate the question from the member uh, opposite. Uh, this is, of course, uh, one of our spectacular beaches uh, uh, in the province. Uh, it does, however, have uh, limitations, and uh, this, again, was uh, part of the plan for this summer. Uh, it will have to be evaluated uh, by the department, but uh, knowing uh, you know, similar uh, uh, situations that uh, would be uh, comparable, it often takes takes uh, some education uh, to get the word out to those who uh, use uh, Carter's Beach. The Honourable Member for Queen Shelburne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank uh, the Minister for uh, his response. For nearby residents, this government's inaction has led to many headaches over the last few years as, they, as uh, residents try to retrieve their mail, get out of their driveways, and even keep their properties clean. Many residents have had to erect signage and even block their own driveways um, so that they would not be blocked by a visitor's vehicle. Getting emergency vehicles to the beach has been a worry for years because traffic is blocking one side of the road and sometimes both. Finally, this is uh, no place for a vehicle to turn around, causing them to have to back out down the road, which is very dangerous given the heavy foot traffic. My question to the Minister is, uh, will the Department work with the Region of Queen's Municipality to address the parking concerns of my constituents? Thank you. The Honourable Acting Minister of the Environment. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, and thank you, Member, for the question. Uh, parking is in indeed one of the very uh, serious problems in the area, having visited the beach on a number of occasions. Uh, some people do park at the nearby uh, provincial park, uh, Summerhill, and, and walk to Carter's, uh, but, uh, but the, there, is a, there, is a, there is an issue, uh, certainly uh, in the immediate area. I know uh, cars were ticketed uh, uh, this summer, uh, but uh, in terms of a long-term resolve, uh, a committee has been put in place uh, to, to look at uh, the best use in this very, very sensitive uh, but uh, ecologically important uh, beach. And in fact, a lot of advisement is about uh, uh, short walks on, on the beach and not spending an entire day there. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Kings North. 
Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, Open Hydro Canada put a large turbine in the Manish Channel on July 22nd. A few days later, they declared bankruptcy and abandoned the turbine. There was no environmental monitoring, and almost everything went wrong with this project. Mr. Speaker, my constituents are now concerned about who will pay for the removal of this now, unfortunately, 400 ton piece of scrap metal, and wonder why there were no performance bonds to guarantee the funds would have been there to clean up any leftover messes. So, my question for the Minister is why. Why did the minister not require a posting of a bond to deal with the cleanup and other environmental effects with the deployment of the open hydro, hydro turbine? The Honourable Minister of Energy and Mines. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank the member for the question. There actually is a bond in place uh, in the event of uh, removal. Uh, that's something that was negotiated uh, when the turbine was actually put into place. Uh, we've had open conversations with all the partners since uh, since the bankruptcy. Uh, we're following the court proceedings uh, that are taking place in Ireland. We have to respect that process. Uh, but communication uh, is open uh, with all of our partners, and uh, we'll wait to see the outcome of that process. Thanks. The Honourable Member for Kings North. To thank the Minister for the answer. Mr. Speaker, given the timing of the bankruptcy, someone in the company had to know what was going down and that the contractors installing the turbine might never get paid. In fact, many Nova Scotians are left being owed considerable sums of money. Suppliers have not been paid. Some of my constituents are owed large sums of money. Mr. Speaker, my question for the Minister, what does the Minister say to these hard-working Nova Scotians who are owed money, who may fa face bankruptcy themselves, and how will the minister act to ensure all Nova Scotian suppliers are paid? The Honourable Minister of Energy and Mines. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank the member for the question. And we've been uh, very uh, uh, open in our discussions with uh, the partners that they should do whatever they can to pay those vendors, uh, those companies uh, in, in the province here. We know some of them have been paid uh, to date. Uh, we continue to send that message to them. Uh, most importantly for us is that we're the regulator of this project. So we, our, our primary concern was that, that the turbine is operating in a safe state, uh, that it was in compliance uh, when the issue took place. Uh, we worked very closely with the partners and continued to monitor the uh, core process in Ireland. Uh, what we know now is that the uh, turbine is not spinning. It is in, uh, it is in a safe uh, operational mode, uh, and we continue to monitor uh, the turbine and, and the area uh, within the area. So, thank you. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Mr. Speaker, this, this week a woman in Cumberland North uh, who was 101 years old died. She was admitted needing medical and nursing care. There were no medical beds available and she spent four days on a stretcher in a busy eMERGE department before being given a bed in palliative care. Her family are angry, and rightly so. My question to the Minister of Health is will the Minister look at the underlying problem of the lack of access to medical and palliative care beds due to the 20% or more of these beds being occupied with people awaiting long-term care to ensure this does not continue to happen to people who are 101 years of age. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, there is a agreement, I think, uh, by all members uh, in the legislature, and, and indeed, uh, I dare suggest, uh, all Nova Scotians, uh, that that's not uh, the type of care we, we strive for or expect, uh, whether uh, at whatever the age of the Nova Scotian uh, in, in need of that uh, care. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, we have uh, been taking uh, steps, uh, always looking for opportunities to improve. Uh, the member uh, referenced the... Um, uh, individuals waiting for long-term care or other services at alternative levels of care. Mr. Speaker, we've seen improvements where the wait time, uh, number of people waiting in those beds, Mr. Speaker, has decreased as well as the amount of time that they're spending in those beds also decreasing. So we're seeing some improvements, Mr. Speaker, with some of the actions we're taking in other parts of the system. But it is an integrated system. We're making a lot of changes and uh, trying to improve the system with our partners. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Mr. Speaker, four years ago, this same woman was taken to the same emergency room. And at that time, she spent three days on a stretcher in a busy eMERGE department. And she told her family that she would rather die than return and have that same experience. Our community identified a few years ago a need for a hospice in our region to ensure people like my 101-year-old friend died with dignity and respect not spend their last days on a stretcher in a hallway in a busy eMERGE department. My question to the Minister of Health, will he work with the people of Cumberland to help us build a hospice to ensure 
people like my friend can die with dignity, privacy, and respect. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, the, the uh, notion of uh, hospice care uh, options is uh, an evolving uh, area. It's one that our government, indeed, my predecessor, the former Minister of Health and Wellness, the current Minister of Community Culture and Heritage, uh, under his leadership, uh, developed uh, for the first time a hospice policy. Uh, so there is a framework in place, Mr. Speaker, that allows community groups and organizations uh, to engage with the health authority and the department uh, to uh, come forward with proposals and we would evaluate those proposals as we would uh, with any uh, request uh, to fit into our overall health care system. So there is a framework in place. Uh, if the member would like more details about the framework, we can certainly get it to her and her community members. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Mr. Speaker, the people who are living in the Lancaster and Willow Ridge neighbourhoods in Dartmouth North are waiting to hear about plans to make the Lancaster intersections safer. I'm wondering if the Minister of TIR could update the House on where his department is on plans to fix the intersection. Section. The Honourable Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for the question. Uh, it's a very good question. It's an intersection that is under scrutiny, significant scrutiny. We are working with uh, the HRM folks uh, about collective solutions, and we're hoping that we will have something ready to go next year. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Minister, for answering my question. I look forward to the updates. <laughs> thank you very much. Time allotted for oral questions put by members to ministers has expired. We'll now move on. To